Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this um, public lecture that uh, is called Virtual Rome, a digital model of the ancient city. And this public lecture should have been actually the, the keynote for the uh, ICS 3D summer school that, um, well, unfortunately, is not running this year because of, um, of you know, the COVID uh, emergency. And we were really looking forward to it. And um, what we wanted to do was basically offering uh, training in the 3D tools and approaches, but also um, framed in, um, uh, you know, in a methodological uh, perspective. And we were especially keen on a focus on both transparency and ethics in the use of um, these 3D technologies and how they can be um, used for research uh, by classicists, archaeologists, ancient historians, and so on. But, um, you know, to uh, a, a consolation for uh, not having our 3D summer school is that our keynotes, uh, both uh, Matthew Nichols and uh, Andrea Wallace, that will talk in two weeks, uh, very kindly agreed to transform uh, those keynotes in public lectures. And I would also like to thank uh, Monica uh, and the Shinoikis' Digital Classics program. This is, you know, hosting this special, uh, this special event. And, um, and now, I mean, it doesn't need uh, much introduction, but uh, Professor Matthew Nichols is now based at Oxford, but um, has also maintained his connection with the University of Reading. And um, one of his main research interests is the built environment in the city of Rome. And he has explored um, how 3D modeling can be used to investigate uh, the built environment of Rome and uh, can be used to teach it. Um, he also teaches a very, very successful free online course uh, on ancient Rome and has won uh, an impressive number of uh, teaching and research awards. So thank you again, Matthew, for joining us today. And um, yes. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Valeria, and to everyone involved in organizing this for the invitation, and to everybody who's out there uh, for coming along. This is the second time I've given a lecture remotely, and it's a slightly strange disembodied experience to have no audience uh, to speak to in front of me, but I hope you're all out there and I hope I say something of interest at this time for some questions at the end. Um, I'm going to start playing my slides and uh, I'm going to assume that people can see these unless a voice comes over the ether saying that they can't. So I'm working on a, a large scale digital reconstruction of the city of Rome. Um, I've been working on it for years in various forms. I no doubt will continue working on it for years more because you can never finish a project on this scale and it's a very agreeable thing to tinker with. Um, and this sort of, of large scale city scale project of imagining and depicting the ancient city can be seen as part of a tradition of imagining and depicting Rome that runs, and I don't intend here any kind of self aggrandizing comparison, but runs from antiquity through people like Ligorio and Duperec in the 16th century, Piranesi and Nolli in the 18th, through the birth of archaeology as an academic discipline, the Beaux-Arts tradition of architectural painting in the 19th century, Lanciani's lovely archaeological maps in the early 20th century, the Gismondi Plastico in the mid to late 20th century as a physical manifestation of Rome in model form. So there's a long, long history of thinking about what ancient spaces and buildings looked like and then representing them in graphic and plastic forms. Um, and digital tools are just an extension of this tradition, I think, allowing more versatility of view, as we'll see, but at least some of the same aims and principles in common and also some of the same constraints and challenges, which is what I'll talk about. Essentially, for as long as people have been encountering the ruins of the ancient past, especially since the Renaissance interest in ancient texts allowed people to start matching ruins to ancient literary descriptions and artworks, people have been trying to deduce and then convey an impression of what these ruins were once like and how people experienced them and used them. Um, so I, I made this digital model as a contribution to that ongoing discussion about the ancient city. I've used it for various um, reasons, uh, various purposes, which I'll tell you about briefly. Uh, perhaps chiefly for this online course that Valeria kindly mentioned, a massive open online course, or MOOC, to use the, the ungainly acronym. 
Uh, I'm now substantially rebuilding it actually and incorporating more systematically now some of the lessons I've learned along the way while doing it because one does learn all sorts of things as, as you do a project this substantial and I realize some of the mistakes I've made or ways I would have changed it. Um, so some of these learning points are, are practical and technical about making and managing a large model about a workflow that leads from research through modeling and rendering to output across three or four different software packages. Uh, others are more methodological, or to use a word that, that Valeria used a minute ago, ethical. Um, what evidence to incorporate, how to interpolate and fill in gaps, what to show, how to show it, what not to show, how to present doubt or alterity, or how to discuss and contextualize and frame what might look like a visually convincing model with something a bit more in depth about where it skims over gaps in evidence or what other versions might be possible. And there are lots and lots of these questions, interesting methodological questions, which one might discuss, and which I've been exploring over the years with fellow academics and heritage sector professionals and game studios and VR firms, commercial illustrators, um, museums and others. I can talk more about those discussions and the questions if that's of interest. In some of these methodological or ethical areas, I think there are no clear answers sometimes, or there can be equally valid but mutually incompatible alternative answers. Uh, so I've tried to think about what I've been doing and why as I've gone along and eventually I've got to a point where I'm taking a step back and starting to remake um, the model with these questions in mind. And that's a sort of, well, it's a work in progress and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute. Uh, some of these choices that one makes in this sort of project are driven by a priori principles. Others have to respect practicalities or just the contingencies of, of, of workflow, the limitations of one's hardware, software, budget, skills, time. The eventual uses such a model will be put to and the nature of the audiences that will experience it. So are we talking about flyovers or street level views? A research audience who appreciate detail and documentation and accuracy and they prize that perhaps over visual um, lavishness or a, a public audience that wants something vivid and convincing perhaps a broadcast for example. Uh, whether the model needs to be made in such a way that you can take it to bits and turn elements of it on and off, as we'll see a bit later, or can be made replaceable for different sorts of view. Buildings are one thing, but what do we do about entourage, as architects call it? That is scenery elements like trees and traffic, furnishing, perhaps above all people. My model doesn't have people, um, but maybe it should, at least it could. That's something to think about. Other areas to think about and make choices in include date, I'll come back to that, the use of color and lighting and shadow therefore, what constitutes an appropriate level of detail, how do we deal with statues, lots more questions like that and there isn't time to discuss anything like all of those but of course if people have questions I'll try to address them afterwards. So I'll, I'll try and skim over at least some of the areas um, there that I've been thinking about in different aspects of this project and suggest some of the uses I'm putting it to in research and in teaching and in outreach towards the end of the talk. Um, but first I'll talk a bit about the modeling process. Um, the main modeling tool that I use um, is SketchUp. So all of the 60 plus thousand elements in this model that you see on the screen here, or almost all of them I should say, were built um, and deployed initially in SketchUp. Um, and then we're taken into uh, different sorts of modeling and rendering software later on to make this kind of large composite view. Um, SketchUp, um, for those of you that know it, um, is, here it is, is a, a rather simple and user-friendly piece of modeling software. Um, I find it actually rather addictively fun. Um, sure, it can be frustrating like any software when you're learning it, but it, it can do a lot and you can do a lot quite quickly with it. It's kind of uh, approachable. Um, the downside of that is that its modeling tools are relatively simple. There are things, some things you can't do, but there's plenty that it can do. And I'd recommend it to you if, if you are looking for a tool to get started in 3D visualization. I know that some of you, at least in the room as it were here, are already pretty proficient in it and indeed in, in other packages too. And um, maybe everyone has their favorite, but this is what I tend to use for my architectural modeling, in part because it's easy enough to be teachable. I'll come on to that later. And also it's fairly universal now. It's widely enough used that it can export to and import from a lot of other very useful pieces of software. So you can use it in lots of different workflows, whether you're going into VR or 3D printing or layout diagrams or um, rendering software, uh, lots of different avenues into and out of the software and large libraries of user-generated content and plugins to extend the core functionality of the software. 
Um, so it's uh, a useful thing to be to be working in. What you're seeing on the screen as I'm talking is a, a little screen grab of me making the Romano British Villa. It's speeded up by about a factor of four. So this two minute video um, is actually only about eight minutes of modeling. And you can see the essential workflow in here starting from a grand plan. I'm now adding a load of, here's one I made earlier, cheat elements, windows and doors. I've got a little library of um, to speed up iterated tasks like making windows and doors. So there we go. That that That's how to make a, a simple villa in SketchUp quickly. And you can see you can get decent-ish results with not much modeling time, which is always nice. So a bit more of a complicated model in SketchUp. Here's the bars of Caracalla um, cut along the center line. You can see, again, I'm proceeding from a grand plan, um, also from site visits and photographs and cross sections and published books about the building, uh, working up towards creating a much more complicated model. This is maybe at the upper end of what SketchUp can do, um, but you can see it's still a pretty credible and detailed model. And then from SketchUp, I can take it across into a rendering program like Cinema 4D, which is what this image was made in. Um, and there around that um, is a topographical model, more about that in a minute, some entourage like trees, other bits of the city, buildings and landscape to give that uh, bathhouse some, some context. Uh, the model of Rome that I've built covers the entire city within the Aurelianic walls and some distance beyond both banks of the Tiber, stopping just short of the Vatican. I wanted to go beyond the Aurelianic wall, which often is a kind of artificial cutoff point in, in maps of ancient Rome. Um, I wanted to show something of the suburbium, even though it's actually quite difficult to reconstruct, and, and no doubt people might do it differently to how I've done it. Um, I wanted to go over a somewhat greater area than the Gismondi model, for example, covers. Uh, the notional date of this model is early 4th century AD, which is a fairly common date for reconstructions of Rome to go for, uh, because it has all of the buildings you'd want to see. Um, if you're going to capture, as it were, the classical city, this is about the age you want to go for. But that question of date is very complicated, um, because almost all the buildings in my model appear simultaneously new, which is a historical nonsense, of course. So it's really an architectural maquette rather than a true historical model at a single historical moment. And that's... Um, kind of a complicated answer to the question I'm almost always asked first, which is what is the date of your model? You can see on the bottom of the slide, circa AD 315 is the date I've written, but actually it's a composite really of different dates. And that's one of the first choices that you face in making a model of this sort. And if you go down one particular track, it starts to exclude others. So I've said that everything here appears simultaneously new, but that's not actually always true. Um, where buildings interrupt or replace earlier structures in this model, I can't show them all kind of simultaneously existing, like having four or five versions of a building all superimposed over each other on the map, I have to pick one. So here where the Aurelianic wall um, cuts through the amphitheater and then the circus at the Caesarian uh, Palace out on the, um, the eastern edge of the city. So you, you can see there that I've had to wreck the circus and build a wall through it and englobe the amphitheater in the city wall. Um, also kind of a reverse process at the bottom with the so-called uh, auditorium of Mycenaeus, where there a later Augustan era building has gone on top of and therefore effaced and partly demolished the earlier Servian wall circuit. So there are buildings in fact in, in the model that replace and occlude and alter earlier ones, but where that doesn't happen everything looks simultaneously new and that historically of course is uh, non, but it's a choice one has to make or at least that I did make to present this particular reconstructive mode for the city. Um, when we start to zoom in on it, as we have done in these pictures, you can start to see that by the standards of some detailed archeological projects, um, this is relatively imprecise, impressionistic. Um, we've just seen it incorporates, knowingly incorporates inconsistencies and wrongnesses. But I think given the citywide scale of the project, the complex nature of the subject material, the nature of the evidence that we have at our disposal and the gaps in that evidence, the multidisciplinarity of the workflow involved in researching and then creating the model, and the fact that I've done it all more or less single-handed means that um, these are choices that you have to make and face. And I think as long as you're upfront about them and acknowledge them as I've just done and kind of show your audience slides about where you've, you've got things kind of deliberately wrong, um, th that is intellectually okay, I think. I think I'm comfortable with that as long as you don't just show a picture of the model and say, this is exactly what it looked like in AD 315 but rather contextualize it and explain it, then those levels of inconsistency seem at least less problematical to me. Um, but zooming out, as it were, I think at the city level, the basic overall shape and scale of the city in the model um, 
out at this kind of 4.5 by 4.5 kilometer map, which is at the base of it, I'm relatively happy with the kind of the macro, even if the micro level, there are difficult um, challenges. In order to address such concerns better, as I said at the outset, I'm currently reworking the model um, based on newly available topographical data. So for example, the Digital Augustan Rome project and the Carandini Carafa Atlas of Ancient Rome. Um, it seemed to me that I'd got to a point with my project that it was time to rebase it to a more consistently accurate standard. Um, the previous version had grown organically over 10 years or so, really without a particularly firm methodological basis. It had kind of grown up piecemeal as I put bits of it together for different purposes. And when these new resources became available, that felt like a good moment to take a step back and restart it. Previously, I'd stitched together all sorts of mapping resources like Lanciani's lovely maps, patched together from separate paper sheets, uh, modern satellite imagery used as a positioning reference, an underlying terrain model where I'd made over time hundreds, probably thousands of separate edits that led it to be questionably reliable, I would say. So what I'm currently doing is rebasing the model on a new terrain and map and reworking large sections of the city as I do that, checking my decision-making process uh, and reconstructive methodology as I've gone along. And I'd love to call that a work in progress, but progress has been limited lately by obvious circumstances. Um, my main computers uh, are down the road at, at work in Oxford. I'm at home. When I was writing this talk, I realized actually how many pictures and images and videos of the model are on that computer down the road and I don't have access to them. So work in progress is optimistic at the moment, but let's call it that. Um, and in that work in progress, um, I've gone through various stages of methodological thought and practical constructive activity. Uh, and as one example, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the terrain model that underlies all of this um, and the base map that I'm building um, with editability in mind. Uh, one of the lessons I've taught myself is that if you think at the outset about how you want to use the model eventually, you, you can build in all sorts of features that are going to be very useful to you later, but quite hard to reverse engineer later if you don't build them in from the start. Terrain here is um, a heavy element. I don't know if you can see on the slide, but ringed in red there, uh, just the map by itself here has 187,703 separate faces in it. So even without buildings on it, this is already a really big model that causes the computer to, to chug and run slow sometimes. So some thought is needed to optimize this and to fit it for whatever purposes I want to put to um, put it to. So I need to think through questions like, what am I going to do with the finished terrain model? What levels of accuracy and detail are needed? How am I going to work with this terrain model in practice, stop it from slowing my computer down? And then there are functional questions. Where will the audience look at this model from? How will they view the terrain? What will you need to be able to see? What role does this underlying terrain model play in the visual address that the overall model makes to the viewer? What's it for? Um, as I make changes to the terrain, as I add buildings, um, for example, as I cut away part of a hillside to make a terrace platform, or I kind of cut a little slot in the model to, to fit in a subterranean structure. Uh, you can maybe see just right of the center in the middle of that model, a, a kind of a little hole cut in the terrain mesh where I've started putting in a, a rectangular base of one particular building. As I make those edits to the terrain, um, how do I do that? And if I want a view of just the terrain, if I'm say giving a lecture on the topography of Rome and I just want the terrain model with no buildings, can I reverse all of those edits and cuts and excavations so I don't present a terrain model full of little holes? Um, those are the sorts of practical questions to, to think about early on. Uh, and so you can focus modeling effort in the right places and help ensure that the model you produce is one you can actually use in the manner that you intend. For the terrain as for everything else in the model, I want to begin with good source data. So I started remaking my terrain model based on new contour data. This is one to 10,000 scale contour data that's based on a modern contour map uh, from the Carta Tecnica Regionale of Lazio that was then adjusted by the Digital Augustan Rome project uh, to approximate ancient ground levels. Essentially, they excluded height data from modern interventions like the Tiber embankments, and they ran a series of, of um, kind of modeling algorithms to fill up, um, or rather to, you know, to, to, to undo the filling up caused by alluvial silting from the river. So they've lowered the ground level in the bottom of the valleys, and some of the hills, I think, are a bit higher. Um, so that's a good baseline, but my model, as I said a moment ago, is set three centuries later than the Augustan period. So I had to make further changes, like cutting out the spur between the Capitoline and Quirinal Hills to make um, a space for the form of Trajan. Um, I had to build Monte Testaccio, the big mound of discarded amphorae sherds in the um, Aventine district, 
uh, which isn't there in the Augustan era model, of course. And then as I've gone along, I need to make hundreds and hundreds of other smaller scale adjustments to um, you know, make the hillside suitable for terracing or make the river embankment suitable for bridges and, and abutments and docks and so on. So what I need to make is an editable, workable terrain model where I can actually get in there and, and edit it and pull it around. So these are my basic contours. Um, I can turn those within SketchUp into a terrain model, and, and here it is. Um, this is uh, already a fairly nice terrain, but it comes with some problems. SketchUp's native terrain tool uh, makes um, what it calls a tin, which is a, a triangular network, and you can see that the irregularly shaped triangles in this mesh come at hugely different sizes. And editing the terrain with a mesh like this consists of pushing or pulling individual vertices or points or faces around higher and lower. And where you're doing that with a really big triangle, that's going to pull quite a large chunk of the city around with it. It makes fine detail editing of terrain actually quite difficult to do. So what I wanted to do was to turn this very large uh, set of triangles into a much more regular terrain mesh that would allow finer detailed work. And you can do that. There are plugins for SketchUp that allow you to do that. But the smaller that mesh becomes, the, the more faces are in the model and therefore the heavier the model gets. So a very large terrain model like this, four, four and a half kilometers on each side, especially when you then drape over it a large image file to act as a map, as I'm about to do, um, this becomes a very substantial model. So there's a need for a compromise between uh, model quality and model size here. And that's got to be driven by hardware considerations and also by an estimate of how you're going to use this model and how accurate is accurate enough for the, the uses you're putting it to. So after some experiment, I tidied up and edited the original raw contour detail. I smoothed out curves, reduced little kind of spikes and funnies in the contour detail. I used it to generate, I, I set the contours at five meter height intervals, which seemed to me accurate enough for the top of the model I wanted to build. I created this uh, initial terrain model and I then uh, did this to it and ran um, a tool on it that turned it from that network of very big triangles into a network of small triangles set in a rectangular grid or, or quadrilateral grid. Um, and I've set those mesh intervals in the end at 15 meters, which felt to me small enough that I could edit it easily and large enough that it wasn't too big. So if you look at this screen grab from SketchUp, you can perhaps see now that if I wanted to grab the edge of one of those triangles and, and make a hillside taller or shorter, it wouldn't edit a huge area of the city. I can be quite localized and, and reasonably precise in my terrain editing now. So that was an important step. And then a combination of the Carandini Carafa Atlas and other mapping data composited together is draped on top of that topographical model as a visual reference. It's not there in the final model, but it's there in the process as a kind of reference source so that I can be sure that standing remains that are documented um, are in the right places. And where I want reference to the modern city, I've got a, a modern city visualization layer in there as well that I can use to make sure that you know, things are in the right place um, with reference to each other and with reference to what we know about the topography of the modern and the ancient city. And the size of that map image is another element that I have to think about and control for. Um, a map image that's you know, a 4.5 kilometer square map is a really, really big graphics file coming in as a TIFF or a JPEG. Um, I can crunch that file down and compress it, but in doing that, the map data gets much coarser. And at a citywide scale, a compressed map becomes useless for fine detail work. So after some experiment, I've ended up with a map resolution that gives me about one pixel of map for each 20 centimeters of real space on the ground. And that's accurate enough for what I want to do. But of course, it's a built-in limitation on the overall accuracy of the model. I can't really claim that anything is more than 20 centimeters in any direction within the right place. So that's a choice that I've made at the outset that's driven by technical considerations and workflow considerations. But it gives a baseline. Um, it gives a, an underpinning of basic cartographic and topographic consistency that I think is going to be important as I turn to spatial turn studies like sightline and viewshed analysis I'm going to come on to in a little bit. So onto that terrain, then I, I research and make and place individual buildings that are researched, as you've seen, from a combination of archaeological, epigraphic, numismatic, Renaissance drawings, literary descriptions, all sorts of, of evidence of that type. I try to make these models detailed. But as we're going to see, detail is sometimes um, not what you want. It's expensive and time consuming to add. And there's an ethical point here, too, that although detail is sort of visually convincing, essentially it makes things look pretty, 
It can also be deceptive if it creates an impression of certainty or too much knowledge, where really an impression of doubt or gaps would be would be more honest, more useful. And that's a problem inherent, I think, in the actual you know, the principle of reconstruction. It, it necessarily involves going on beyond the evidence to fill in missing bits. Otherwise, it wouldn't be reconstruction. Um, but in doing that, you're making a claim, and the more detail you invest in that claim, the more open you are, I think, to criticism that you've gone beyond your evidence. So it's kind of a balance to strike um, when modeling at this scale. So to give you one example of that, how to model the urban backdrop. The main monuments in Rome, the, the pictures in the slide here, are relatively well known from literary sources and from archaeological remains, and modeling them therefore calls for greater precision, but relatively less guesswork. But if we don't add to those monuments the kind of clutter and backdrop of the residential city, those miles and miles of residential streets that Pliny talks about, um, then you don't have a city model. You have a kind of series of monuments poking up out of this flat, empty desert. So if we intend to make use of digital modeling for research into, let's say, sight lines within the ancient city, we've got to create some sort of clutter to frame and partly obscure the major monuments and, and to have those monuments correspond as they once did to much denser networks of more organically shaped windy city streets. The difficulty is how to do this when we have relatively little substantial archaeological information for the great majority of average low status residential and commercial buildings in the ancient city. They were insubstantial to begin with and until fairly recently they've been less interesting to archaeologists so they're just much less well documented. So to do this and fill in the city with that clutter, that backdrop, necessarily means going beyond the evidence, extrapolating, um, if you like, guessing. A series of questions in doing that, you know, do we know where the streets ran, where buildings or districts have vanished? Can we try to reconstruct them and fill in the blanks? What is the best way to do that? What is the right mix of buildings, the right sort of materials? Lots of sources one can use. There are some standing remains of residential buildings like here, the Aritalia Insula, it's kind of a brick and concrete multi-story apartment block on one of the flanks of the Capitoline Hill in Rome. We can go to places outside Rome like Pompeii or maybe better Ostia um, and get a sense of this sort of brick and concrete, tightly packed multi-story commercial residential mix. But we have to do that with caution. Pompeii and Ostia are not Rome. Um, they're different places with kind of different urban needs and solutions. So they're um, an analogy rather than an absolute solution for Rome itself, but you know, they are useful. My favourite source is the marble map of Rome, this marvellous 3rd century AD marble artefact based on a survey of the city that carves down to the level of individual doorways and staircases and columns um, a 2D planimetric impression of the city on marble slabs that have now broken into fragments. About 10% maybe of the city survives on these fragments, and sometimes we know where they go, so here, this fragment from the Quirinal Hill um, goes there, and I've made everything that appears on it and turned it into 3D SketchUp models and then dropped that into the terrain model. So here you can see that ancient planimetry turned into 3D content and put into a 3D topographical model. So wherever we have a placed fragment, a known fragment of the former Urbis, I've done that. So I think this is, um, uh, you know, as far as I know, the only model that has taken every known fragment of the former Urbis and, and incorporated it. And those fragments, um, you know, as you can see here, they cover reasonably decent chunks of the city. Here is another one on the Esquiline Hill where we can, as, as Caratoni's done there, kind of integrate the fragments. And I've filled in the gaps between them and then turned that 2D work into 3D work and then colored it in and put it onto the topo model again. So you can build up by filling in the gaps and extrapolating a reasonable sense, at least the kind of the texture of the city or the rhythm of the city as I've come to think of it. Um, the straight and angled streets and the mix between those, the relative density of building versus open areas, the ratios of height to width of various types of building, um, the, the inter between big rectilinear public monuments with large areas of open space and maybe formal planting or pools, and much more tightly packed windy residential clutter, and the way that the monuments play on that clutter to achieve really remarkable openness and symmetry. Um, the, the marble plan gives us that, and in combination with places like Ostia, I think allows us a fair basis on which to extrapolate the infill of the city. Um, but it is, in the end, fundamentally about, about guesswork, educated guesswork maybe, but about you know, filling in blanks. Um, so something 
type in because I've made this new version of the model, and here we are zoomed out looking at the new terrain model with the Caratani, sorry, Carafa um, and Carandini Atlas draped over the top of it, and then my 3D models in place on top of that, um, is finding a way of illustrating what we know and what we don't know. And one of the ways that I want to do this is visually. So, so far I've been doing it verbally. I've been talking to you about where the limits of knowledge are. And I think that kind of verbal context is important. But given that this is a visual medium, I also want to experiment with visual means of showing that. So here is that area with everything we know about still in color. So in this southern chunk of the city, we're essentially talking about stuff known from the marble plan. And if you know the marble plan of Rome, you'll recognize um, the bits around the um, so-called Portux Emilia and the Perea Galbana over there on the left, or the stuff around the Circus Maximus, and the stuff on the the the, the here around the Temple of Claudius there. Over on the um, the right bank of the Tiber, you've got uh, Tucci's uh, um, reconstructions of how the former obus there gives us quite a large chunk of Trans Tiberim. So in colour, we have the known areas, and in in white is conjecture. And being able to toggle between the two is a nice thing you can do in a digital medium. So if you want the full color kind of uh, vivid reconstruction, you can do that. But if you want to discuss doubt and variance, you can do that. And the same model, if you build this in from the start, uh, which I am now doing for the first time, um, allows you to, to show that. Here it is a, a bit more detail zoomed in. So here's this um, Aventine area uh, in full color and with just the, the solidly known bits in full color and the conjecture in white. And you can see that the color bits at least give us the, the basic bones of these districts and where the streets are and what the building mix is. And from there, I've, I've uh, extrapolated, uh, experimenting, as I say, with visual ways of showing that. So having made this kind of a model, what can we do with it? Um, fresh from writing an REF ref impact case study, which was taken up an earlier part of this week, um, I'm, uh, my head is full of all the commercial uses we put this to. This is a broadcast use of the model. This is my model but dressed up and made rather lovely by a VFX firm in London for broadcast on the Travel Channel um, in America. So there they can add kind of cinematic effects. And if we look at that again, you can see reflections and ripples on the river. You can see smoke coming out the chimneys. You can see a little flock of seagulls flying across from left to right there. A crowd of thousands of people in the Circus Maximus. Uh, these are not necessarily things I do myself in a kind of academic model, but they do look rather gorgeous. So. Um, there is a, a commercial use, a broadcast use. Um, as Valeria mentioned at the outset, I've also made this the basis of a free online course. It's running at the moment, actually. About 50,000 people have taken this course now. And over those five weeks, here's one of the weeks, part of one of the weeks, we talk uh, about the digital model, but also we use that as a way of illustrating the history of the architecture of ancient Rome. So we talk about the topography of the city and the roads, the sewers, the aqueducts, the infrastructure, religious buildings, political buildings, residential and commercial buildings, and then buildings for entertainment in each of those five weeks. And we've had you know, about 50,000 people come along with us. Some really good discussions actually in that platform. It's a good social learning medium. So people look at the videos and they do the quizzes and read the articles I've written and then they kind of talk about them. And that's a, a really nice public deployment of it. Within that MOOC, I've also uh, used live 3D. So this is a screen grab of an app on my phone called Cubity Go. And what I've done is take my SketchUp model here of the bars of Caracalla, drop that into Cubity Go, which crunches it and turns it into a model that you can explore on the phone. So there I am turning the color on and off again if you want to experiment with color. You can change the time of day so the shadows will change. You can move it around with your fingers. And here I'm dragging a little man into it like Google Earth. And you can go and stand inside it. And when you tap the phone screen, you start walking around. So you can you can look around with your finger or you can tap and then start walking around. Here we go, we're moving through it. So this opportunity to do immersive 3D, I think is really, really important. I think if, if there's a question about where is this going next, where does this, this technology take us next? I think the answer has to be about immersivity, real-time navigation, maybe virtual reality, maybe gaming engines or tools like Cubity that allow us not just to show people pictures of the model, but to step inside and look around for themselves. And certainly I find my own impressions of the city and what I learn about the city are much more vivid when I'm inside it. So there are there are outreach deployments of this. Um, there are also research deployments of models like this, um, things we can do with research. As I said at the outset, my individual buildings are, as you can see now, we're inside the bars of Caracalla. Yeah, they, they're good enough for flyovers, but they're not super detailed or super accurate close up. But at the level of the district or the city-wide scale, I think 
this kind of massing model does allow us to do quite a lot in research terms around uh, sightline studies, view sheds, illumination studies, for example. And this coincides with the, the spatial turn, as we, we term it, in humanities scholarship, which is helping us develop methods for understanding the experience of the built environment, especially movement is now quite big in spatial turn studies. So from Diane Favreau's book in the mid 90s there, The Urban Image of Augustan Rome, which was an important early exponent of this sort of approach, this imaginary journey at the end of the book through the city um, of, that Augustus built, thinking about how these monuments appeared and how they're experienced. Um, we go through other uh, more recent books like Lawrence and Newsom's Rome Ostia Pompeii, or The Moving City there, the edited volume on the right, The Moving City, that thinks about processions and passages and promenades through the city and what movement does to the experience of space. Or um, Jeremy Hartnett's book, that takes it down to really focus kind of street corner micro level in Pompeii and thinks about what particular micro environments within the city felt like and how they could be experienced, what they meant and how Roman or Pompeian viewers would, would read them and experience them. Um, and in uh, the Imaging Ancient Rome supplementary volume there, the gray volume top right, uh, Diane Favreau called for digital reconstruction as an academic pedagogical tool, as laboratories for experiments, she wrote, in which to see is to question. I, I hope that's what I'm trying to do, however imperfectly, however approximately, um, to, to give us a sense in which these great monuments were not kind of abstract, free-floating complexes, but actual real spaces shoehorned into the winding streets of a busy city um, that real people saw in, in, at a human scale, at ground level, not as we always do in academic books, floating above them, looking at them in a kind of detached planimetric map form way, but down at ground level, um, kind of moving in and out of them, partly obscured, not seeing all of them at once. And it seems to me, um, to take up Favreau's manifesto, there's, there's quite a lot we can do with this sort of model in that way. Um, I'll give you one little example. Um, this inscription of the Ludi Circulari of 17 BC, Circulari, sorry, 17 BC, um, gives us Augustus's timetable for a set of... Uh, religious celebrations in Rome that also include entertainments, uh, theatrical games and, and athletic games. The um, inscription at the bottom of this bit of the inscription gives us the, the timetable, in fact, and it shows a pattern of nocturnal sacrifices to the Greek gods and Latin plays at a festival location on the northern campus Martius, around letter A on my map here, um, alternating with daylight sacrifices to the Roman gods in the center of the city on the Capitoline and Palatine Hills, and then a series of entertainments that take place in the spaces between these two poles. So it, it sets up a sort of axis across the city or a route within the city, along which lots of people would have moved over the days of the, the uh, secular games between these venues, stopping off to look at entertainments um, in the, the entertainment days tacked onto the end of the religious festival. And within the digital model, we can walk along this route um, taking the epigraphic text and putting it into the model to see roughly what participants would have seen. So here at the end of that route, um, festival goers experience the Augustan space of the Circus Flaminius with those Augustan portico monuments on the left and the theatre of Marcellus capping off the view at the end with the later Arch of Germanicus um, framing the view on the left-hand corner of that square. And then up on the hill, the Capitoline temples acting as the kind of telos as the goal of this whole procession and they're, they're in view over almost all of the length of this procession if you walk along it in the model so this kind of model eye view takes the epigraphic material and turns it into the lived experience or starts to turn it into the lived experience of these secular games um, and one particularly nice thing i discovered when playing with this is that the um, bit at the end of the text here i've transcribed it gives us the timetable for theatrical games in 17 BC. We know the dates, it's early June, 17 BC. And we know the times because the inscription gives us first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour. You know that Roman solar hours begin at sunrise and end at sunset. So we can work out that the first hour is about half past four in the morning in June in ancient Rome, 17 BC. The end of the fourth hour is about 9.30 in the morning. So these are, these are morning plays, these are matinee performances. I wanted to work out whether there's any particular significance to the times and venues chosen. In 17 BC, Augustus, as he put on these games, had a brand new theatre to use in Rome. You've just seen it. It's the Theatre of Marcellus at the end of the Circus Flaminius. It's, it's Theatre C on this map. And one thing you can see about Theatre C here is that it points southwest. All the other theatres in Rome, both contemporary and later, that you see on this map, 
Roman numeral 2, B, and 5 in the middle of the Campus Martius, they all point east-west, right? They all line up um, for reasons that must be to do with solar illumination, as well as the strong north-south axis in this part of the, the Campus Martius. But the Theatre of Marcellus doesn't. It points in a different direction. It's only significance to the particular timetable that Augustus has, has chosen for these games, um, given the alignment of this theatre. So I, I took my Theatre of Marcellus model, which is at the right latitude and longitude, and what we see here is a looping animation of how um, that model appears during the fourth hour, that is the hour stipulated for theatrical entertainment in this particular theatre. And what you can see is that at the beginning of the hour, the, the shadow kind of moves across the stage like the curtain rising, the sun is full on the stage for the hour of the, the games themselves, and at the end, the shadow falls down across the stage, as it were, the curtain falling on Augustus's uh, entertainment. Uh, so the, the sun illuminates the actors. It's not in the eyes of the spectators as they sit um, in these seats. It seems to me that this theatre is built essentially for morning entertainments in the summer. Um, the other theatres are more useful in the afternoon. We know that Augustus is heavily into solar imagery and claims an affinity with the heavens and lines up other monuments like his horologium to harness his kind of astronomical knowledge and display it to the citizens of Rome. So it doesn't seem to me to be too big a leap to... Uh, look at the inscription here, look at the digital model of the theatre and find that the, the solar illumination of the stage maybe is part of the point of this um, way of, of choosing this venue for this particular subset of the Ludi Circularis, which in the end are all about the relationship between heaven and earth. So there are the things you can do in a research sense with models like this that I hope kind of add to the repertoire that you could have done with other media like um, paintings or line art or, or, or physical models. They're all useful. This is useful perhaps in a different way, adding a new tool to the toolkit. And as well as research, we can use it for teaching. Um, and I think I'm coming towards the end of my time, but I might quickly show you, because I think it might be of interest to this audience, uh, one teaching application of this model that Valeria was kind enough to mention earlier on. Um, of course, you can make images and then put them into slide sets, which is what I've been doing for the last three quarters of an hour. Um, but what I found students were saying to me was, how did you do this? Can you show us how you did this? Please, can we have a go at doing this ourselves? So I created an undergraduate module at Reading built around SketchUp and built around the concept of digital reconstruction of the ancient past. Um, and what we do in that is a mixture of theoretical and practical lessons. So the kind of very condensed talk I've just been giving you spins out over 10 teaching weeks. And we talk about methodology and ethics and research and visual modes of display and what you include and what you don't include. And we have software sort of master classes in which I teach them how to use SketchUp and they, they learn. We um, teach it often over two terms, but it's 10 teaching weeks. So in alternate weeks across two terms. And I give them a little model halfway through that. So they have to have learned the software by about halfway through and a big model at the end where they choose a bit of ancient Silchester um, and make me a digital model of it. Why Silchester? Because it's near to Reading. It's been very well excavated. We know a lot about it. But as you can see from the aerial photo, not very much is visible on the surface, apart from that uh, polygonal wall circuit you can see there. So it's a really good target for digital modelling. Kind of a rich body of knowledge can be used to turn what is now a series of empty fields in Hampshire into a visual approximation of what the town once looked like. And it turns out that you can teach undergraduates sketch up it relatively easily within about 10 weeks. SketchUp is very approachable software. I, I teach it in primary school workshops, for example, sometimes. So you can get far and faster with it you know, pretty well. So this is the little halfway model. Um, and you can see already in this that students are using lots of different visual approaches, plan views, cutaway views, exploded views, photoreal views. This is really pleasing uh, already to see students experimenting with the very different kinds of visual presentation digital models can give us. And they're thinking about what the functionality of those different visual modes is. Are you going for a realistic immersive view, a more kind of information rich plan view, a section of the building that shows you not what it looked like, but how it's constructed. Um, this is really interesting to, to play around with the visual as a means of researching and conveying information about the ancient world. And then by the end of the course, where they make bigger models, um, you can see they can do very nice work. So. Um, they hand in to me a digital model with a written commentary, but you can see in the top left, one student also sent me an, an animated slide set uh, of, of what we might call a four-dimensional model, a diachronic model showing change over time as one particular insula within Silchester got successively enlarged and updated and changed by different generations of inhabitants. So this sort of digital modeling um, teaching 
encourages, I think, new approaches to traditional questions about evidence and presentation. It encourages critical engagement with the way the past is presented visually that otherwise I find sometimes undergraduates don't make. They can be very, very critically astute when dealing with a written text and then not bring those same kind of questioning instincts to bear on a visual source unless you kind of show them that actually all visual sources embody, as I've just been telling you, shortcuts and suppositions and conventions and decisions and choices and agendas um, that underlie the visual presentation just as much as they would underlie a, a verbal argument. So this encourages people to critique the visual and it also teaches a set of distinctive and useful software skills. Right? They learn 3D modeling and SketchUp. And I know of students who've gone on to use that in later research degrees, uh, masters and doctoral degrees, or they've gone on to be teachers. They use it with their own pupils, for example. So in, in this student work, I hope you can see some of the potential for using this sort of thing pedagogically. And I think there's going to be huge potential for this as gaming engine software, as virtual reality, as augmented reality. Uh, becomes more common in our classrooms and indeed in our own research practice. So there's potential here for integration into all sorts of research and teaching contexts and all sorts of disciplines and it allows another approach to the ancient world. It doesn't replace everything else that we've traditionally used, it supplements it and it enables a range of questions about how we imagine and envision and present our understanding of what the ancient past was like. And I hope that these brief examples of research and outreach and teaching uses of this model and some of the practical questions that are inherent in the process of putting it together um, shows something of what we can do with this technique as we all learn um, how to do it differently and how to do it better. So I think I've probably gone on uh, long enough um, and I, I'll thank you very much for your, your interest and if there's time um, I'd be very happy to, to take some questions if people want to ask any. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was really, really, really interesting. And I think you touched on so many uh, really key points that, um, okay, I'll try to be a nice host and I will let, you know, other people ask questions first, but I have quite a few. So, I thought uh, you would. Let's start, let's start with the room. Um, Gabby, Monica, Hannah, do you want to ask something to, to Gabby? In the meantime, for the people that are following, um, these on YouTube, if you have questions, I see that uh, Colin uh, kicked off uh, the uh, the YouTube questions. If you have questions, feel free to use the, the YouTube live chat and we will read the questions um, to, to Matthew. So uh, who wants to start? Can I start? <laughs> okay, so well, thank you, it was really uh, great. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist and I will use uh, philological terms. So you showed us uh, uh, what mm -hmm. I can define a critical reconstruction of Rome and you showed us uh, how you represent, for example, conjectures using colors. So we can see uh, the white yeah. color for your conjectures. And I imagine that you can also represent variants in the sense that, of course, uh, even if there is a lot of documentation and evidence, uh, we can have different uh, reconstructions of monuments. So we can represent both variants and conjectures as in philology. And if you want to document this, so uh, this is your, of course, reconstruction following evidence and um, other studies. So how can you document mm -hmm. this uh, um, beyond the, vi the, the visual representation? So you use colors and then how can you do that? So if, if I want to follow your, your critical reconstruction, of yeah. mm -hmm. Sure, that's a good good question. That's another thing that I'm doing in this new version of the model that I didn't do properly before, because the, the answer to the question, where is the metadata was, it's all it's all in here. Um, and that in the end is limiting uh, and it's not scientific. So what I've been doing as I've been remaking the model is to create for myself a database. Well, not for myself, I mean, for the project, a database, uh, which um, I so I divided the model into grid squares. And I've given all the major structures within the model numbers. And where I make a decision, I try to record succinctly within that document. Who, what have I, you know, who have I followed? Have I followed Smith or Bloggs here? Have I followed you know, Carandini or Lanciani here? Or have I, for some other reason, made a decision of my own that departs from standard wisdom on this building? So there is now a database that underpins the model and should be published alongside it. Um, but there's a question about how you access that and, and who sees it because if i'm showing this to say public audience in the mooc um 
that becomes quite cumbersome. People aren't going to go want to read it. So how do you footnote a model? Ideally, what I would like to do is to create a visual interface where you click on a building and the information pops up. And if you look, for example, at the UCLA Digital Roman Forum, some of the Roman Reborn work, um, there are on-screen ways of linking the, the model to the metadata or the information underpinning the model, which I think is the optimum. But that's an interface design problem, which I'm not a web designer, I can't easily solve. So for now, it exists in a separate database, but the hope is that that information could be deployed in various ways and different formats according to the use that I want to make of the model in the future. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, we can then maybe take the, the first um, question from the audience, uh, which comes from Colin that asks, um, the regionary catalogs date from the fourth century. Did you find anything in them of any use for your virtual realm model? Yes, so they're useful for um, a quantity, right? They tell you how many buildings of what type are in there, and they tell you what regions those buildings are in. So it's both useful and a challenge because there are some buildings that are named in the regionary catalogues that we have no idea what they look like or where they go. They're just somewhere within a few square miles of Rome. Um, so that is a there. There's a, an evidential. You have evidence that you really ought to put into the or ought to be reflected in the model, but you can't because it's not enough evidence to tell you what to do. So there are disparities between what I've done and the uh, the digital model, but there are also helpful clues where. If it says you know, there is a, a bath of Decius in this quarter of the city and you have a bit of the marble plan that looks like a bathhouse, it's kind of the right area of the city, that might be the bath of Decius and you might choose to label it as such and then record that within the database. So uh, the answer is yes, um, but it's it, like the, the former Urbis, the marble map, it's a, it's a tantalizing source because it, it, it tells you that there is knowledge there, but it's, it's not easy to pin it to the, the map of the city in Toto and, and show it. Um, like with the marble map being a series of jigsaw puzzle fragments, and not all of which can be placed and therefore can't be incorporated in the model. So um, yes is the short answer, and then the longer answer is the more complicated one I've just given, but it is a good source. Um, thank you, Matthew. And while we wait maybe for more questions from the audience to come, um, may I ask you to uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the methodology that you have used to create what you called let's say the clutter the the filling yeah. between you know the major uh, monuments and i mean i imagine that you have uh, taken some information from the forma urbis but did you devise I don't know parameters or did you devise you know um a workflow that was repeatable or did you just go with a you know your gut instinct like okay I have mm. uh, I have a feeling of you know as as you called it the rhythm of the city so I think I can you know make ad hoc um, solutions. Well, a, a bit of all of that um, uh, modeling at this scale, uh, in order to be able to do it within the scope of a single lifetime, in the end you have to cut not well, not cut corners but make you know make quick decisions about little bits of Rome that you could go one of a dozen different ways and you've, you've just got to do something and put something down and that that's why i quite like this tool of being at least being to show people bits that are made up so at least you can say well here's the guesswork and you can discount it if you want but in terms of methodology uh starting with the marble plan because that is known information and that for each distant the, the known fragments are scattered fairly widely across the city so they give us quite a nice cross section uh, and you can use those to determine the density and rhythm of buildings. And what you see is that it's pretty densely packed, um, that big arterial roads are important, um, that buildings stagger right up the hillsides, that uh, terracing is done, that staircases are put in, that there's, there's a, a lot of single room shops opening onto the street. Those uh, data are useful to extrapolate from. So I start with that. I start with known. And also keyhole excavation and you know, published uh, there's a, a nice bathhouse under termini station that i've put in there's the headquarters of the uh, the green chariot racing faction in campus martius that is dug and i put that in and um bits under st john lateran and those are in so you know wherever we know about dug stuff i also that goes into so we start from what we know and then we fill in the blanks um i sort of in that answer i've just given actually some of the precepts that i've developed about what goes where. So big arterial roads attract dense building. The closer you get to the center of the city, the denser stuff is. The further out you get, you get into villas, gardens, vineyards, more rangy single story buildings. 
Um, you can draw analogies with modern cities there if you want to, though, of course, there's no mechanized transport in Rome, so it's a bit different. Um, I don't, what I don't have is a formula because everything is hand built, and in the end, I'm making what you call gut instinct decisions. Yeah, I think I'm happy with that. Kind of hopefully, it's a good gut, it's kind of informed by now, but instinctive decisions about about what should go where based on what I know about the topography and, and rhythm of the city. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, what I don't have is um, an algorithm. Now you can you can model cities algorithmically. There's procedure, as you very well know, there's procedural modeling where you, you set a set of mathematical parameters and you, you seed it with a kind of library of building types. And then you say, so now build me Pompeii or build me Rome. And that's been done. Um, and that's a good way of doing it. And at least there's a kind of solid scientific methodology under there that you can query and you can change the parameters and see what, what changes and you can't do that with my model because it's all i'm just i'm hand drawing it all but i'm doing it based on that that mix of approaches yeah thank you okay. um yeah we have one more question from our youtube audience um taylor is asking well i'm very interested in your model of the path of caracalla did you use the dimensions from the lanes work yeah, so that that uh, slide early on that showed my cross section that was sat on top of one of Janet's plans. I should have did I put that on the slide? I hope I did. If I didn't, apologies, Janet. Yes, that's a, a Janet Delane plan, and there are also cross sections in that. If you you know the wonderful volume on the bars of Caracalla, where you can fold out the back of it, it's full of all these wonderful um, cross sections. Um, so yes, but however detailed the book is, there are always when you're trying to draw the building in three dimensions corners. Or elements that just aren't there and i've been to that bathhouse so many times and photographed it thousands and thousands of photographs inevitably when i get back to my desk and i want to know how did that wall meet that wall and that vault i don't have a photograph of it and i have to go back and look at it again so yes um both the dimensions from the plans and delay and also her text and explanation of the functioning of the building um are very important because she obviously knows has thought very deeply about what each room is for and therefore how to complete the vaults and, and where the water sources are um, but also autopsy and site visit and also filling in the in the blanks. And there you can compare it, for example, to the bars of Diocletian where the Tepidarium survives much better. It's still got the vaulting on the roof. So you can go and look at other buildings and try and work out how you replace the missing elements within something like the bars of Caracalla. Thank you. Yes, Gabby, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, Matthew, if you've included in your, um, in your model anywhere any contribution from other people, um, you know, small models, parts of models um, that, that have been made by other people, or if you could imagine, if you could imagine doing so. I was, I was interested, for example, that you, um, you set your students um, building things from Silchester and not from Rome, because you could have, you know, potentially, um, you know, had, had to sort of factor them into a collaboration some. Yeah, um, that's something I'd, I'd like to do a bit more of. I mean, th yes, there are there are models in my model that other people have partly contributed. Some of them are a bit like George Washington's axe, you know, that someone lent me a model, gave me a model, and I started with it, but then I, I tinkered and played around and replaced all the elements several times. So there is somewhere in there other people's thoughts and contributions, but I've redrawn it many times, partly to get it to a sort of look and feel consistency, because that's not something I talked about, but... Um, I find that having a kind of consistent look and feel in terms of material choices and proportions and fenestration and roof pitches and stuff um, helps the model read as a kind of coherent entity. So around about the forum in the center of town, years and years ago, I was working with a guy in Portugal called Pedro Martins and he contributed some of the, the originals from my forum buildings. And then later on at Reading, I employed some graduate students in, a, in an early phase of the model to make some of the, the clutter as I called it for me because I was concentrating on the big buildings and I wanted to make the backdrop, you know, quickly. So I set the, that's kind of like procedural modeling, but with people, I gave them some streets and said, I want this kind of density, this kind of height mix, these kinds of building types. Here's a little library of buildings to, to act as examples. Off you go. Um, and I guess some of that is still in there, but I, I remade and remade and remade those over the years because I wanted to incorporate different thoughts and my own workflows and this kind of look and feel I talked about um so yes there is some stuff in there that other people have contributed but it's it's basically all remade now um or, or edited by me and the great majority of it is drawn from scratch by me but if under that question is wouldn't it be nice or sensible 
um, to contribute so you can go further faster and do it a collaborative scholarly way. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I mean, what I would like to do one day is have not one Rome, but like 10, you know, uh, Republican, uh, mid-Republican Rome, late Republican Rome. Do you know the Digital Roman Forum project that the Humboldt in, in Berlin, wonderful series of kind of diachronic models showing the forum evolving. It'd be lovely to do that for the whole city of Rome, but it took me 10 years to make one. So to, to go further, um, you'd need lots of different contributions and that would be a, a really good, really good project and would require an awful lot of kind of careful methodological thought and documentation and setting standard technical standards and modeling standards. It'd be a good thing to do. Yeah, but the, I mean, that, that would yeah, no, be you know, something that really calls for, you know, collaboration, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it would. Um, uh, and from lots of different sorts of uh, source. So maybe that would be a, a great grant project for someone to run somewhere and we you know, have a, a scientific board to, to run it and then people could contribute their models and you could add it to the metadata when you click on the modelers who built it. Oh, I see someone's tweeting about yesterday. Yeah, Hannah Cornwell. Yes, for diachronic models on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Four <laughs> D modeling, I, I think of it as, and it's really useful. I've done a bit of it in the MOOC, for example. What I do is kind of fly around to the landscape of um, let's call it Romulus's Rome, where everything's marshes and trees, and then we fade the buildings back in. Um, and that's really it's a really powerful visual tool, and it'd be lovely to have a slider where you kind of see the Colosseum replace Nero's boating lake. Um, that'd be great. Yeah, we have one more question from Alexandra. It says, in your 2013 piece, Roman Library as Public Buildings, some, someone has done the readings here, you have some lovely reconstructions of the libraries at Ephesus and Thingad. Have you done reconstructions of provincial cities? Uh, thank you for reading that piece, Alexandra. I've done reconstructions of provincial libraries because my doctoral work was on libraries, and I started getting into 3D reconstruction for, for library buildings specifically. I found myself drawing and a lot of them to illustrate my thesis and I can 3D model better than I can draw and quicker. So I ended up um, using that. And then from there, I made you know, Ephesus and Tim Gad. You're kind to say those are nice models, thank you. Um, what I haven't done is make whole provincial cities, but um, it was that idea of setting a library building in its context, which is the argument I wanted to make in my thesis. These are monuments that exist in an urban context. You have to make the streets and the surroundings. And then it went from there and got bigger and bigger. So I want to do Ephesus and Alexandria and Athens and Pompeii, but um, you know, all in good time. Oh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, um, maybe I can sneak in one more question. Um, and I was, I was wondering if you have, cons I mean, now that you have created, you know, this great resource, uh, you know, this model of Rome. If you have already used, or if you're planning to use, um, uh, for example, 3D models of actual artifacts that were, you know, that are associated to that particular building to populate the model, if you're using like mosaics and frescoes and things like that, you know, to be placed mm -hmm. in the right, you know, architectural context so that there is, let's say, a mutual enrichment for the artifact to be seen you know, in the architectural uh, setting and for the, you know, for the building to be seen not as an empty box, but, you know, more of a lived space. Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, yes is the short answer. I'd like to do more of it. Statues is a whole subject to itself. Statues being organic shapes are hard to model and they're high polygons, so they're hard on the computer. But they're really essential because a lot of Roman buildings are essentially backdrops of statues, or at least partly functioned as, as back, back. So the, the Temple of Concord in the Roman Forum, for example, Pliny tells us that it's known for its artworks. And we have a coin that shows all the acroterial statues and the, the statues on the steps. So I've put them in, but I put them in as kind of blobby statue avatars because I, I can't make and don't have the computer capacity to make <coughs> you know, the, uh, what's called the marble population of Rome, all the thousands and thousands of statues. Um, but you've got to have markers in there that say, well, there were statues. So what I tend to do is put in kind of blobby statue, statuesque shapes um, to show um, there's kind of a bit more, I don't know, a, a bit more Henry Moore than Praxiteles. They're kind of big shapes that show there were statues here. Um, actual real artifacts where we know about them and can pin them. Yeah, I've, I, I have started to do that a bit. So inside my model of the Templum Parkis, I've got the former Urbis up on one of the walls and you can go in and look at it. And I think it'd be really nice to start doing that with more buildings. I mean, the trouble often is that we don't actually know exactly what the statues look like and where they went. So you then get into that argument that I touched on about 
how much detail starts to be dishonest. Um, but as long as you're saying this is an impression as to what it might have looked like, I think that's fine. And I, I have done a bit of that, and I'd like to do more. Um, and one of the things I'm doing is taking models of particular buildings, like the Pantheon, the bars of Caracalla, and fitting in much more detail, and all the colored marbles on the floors, the columns, uh, trying to put in. You mentioned mosaic and fresco. Of course, we have quite a lot of the mosaic from the bars of Caracalla. So I've started filling in the blanks in that and putting all those in on the floors. So yeah, and that adds a lot um, to the impression of the space. Actually, for the bathhouse, question you didn't ask, but in, in terms of what really adds vividness, I found sound is really, really, and that's a whole other subject. Um, but if we're doing visual modeling, um, oral modeling is also possible. And the stay dripping water and kind of echoiness or the hubbub of a crowd, those all add a lot to a bathhouse space as well. Yeah, that's something that I've learned attending uh, gaming conferences. Uh -huh. that a lot of the you know atmosphere is actually given by sound and not yeah. not, not by visual stimuli so that's not something i would have expected but yeah it, it's i've seen that in the mooc as well so uh, we ask people within this online course you know what do you like about the models what's missing and the two things that people say most often i think are they want people in there as kind of scale markers but also because they like to see people and they want sound and both of those are about atmosphere aren't they and impression and that's a really important goal of what i'm trying to do but it's also starting to be cinematic and a bit it, it, i feel that an, an empty architectural maquette looks kind of eerie in a helpful way that it, it, it reminds you that it's an architectural maquette it's a tool for thinking with it's not a time machine that takes you back to a particular tuesday afternoon in 8315 so i've slightly resisted the sound and the people, but then you saw in that cinematic flyover that from the documentary how lovely it looks, and you've got the golden evening sun and the smoke coming out the chimneys and the little seagulls, and suddenly it looks, you know, you can see why people want that. So, if a legitimate goal is architectural, it kind of sen multi sensory impression, and there is a strand of scholarship now that's very into that, then that's a really fun thing to experiment with. You just have to tread a little carefully, I think. Okay, we are, yeah. Yeah, Hannah. I was just going to ask, uh, in terms of color, then, I know you had the grass and things like that, but where mm. do you kind of draw that line between, you know, architectural color and it not just being white marble? And how do you deal yeah. with it? Yeah, really good question. Um, I like, like with the, um, Valeria's question about gut instinct, it's not a very comfortable sort of answer to give in a scholarly forum, but um, partly that, I mean, we're, we're, you know, there's oodles of scholarship now on how ancient Rome wasn't gleaming white marble, not the statues, not the buildings. This we know. So at least where the building materials have a native colour, I've put that in. I've experimented with painting on some of the buildings, uh, fresco inside and kind of architectural painting outside. Um, haven't yet done it on statues, because I said my statues are more kind of blobby statue markers and real statues. And there's also a question about how vivid this paint would have been given some of these buildings. Are, I said they all look simultaneously new, but then should they be weathered and or should they not be? So it opens up some methodological conundrums, conundra, um, that, uh, yeah. So I've, I've tried to put um, the color of travertine stone and the color of colored marble. And I've also got a big blue sky and I've also got shadows so that at least there's a bit of, of color in there. And the other thing I put in is vegetation. So I said, I, I don't do people, and I don't do kind of graffiti and rubbish and scaffolding and smoke, but I do do trees. And there's a logical inconsistency in that, but trees are so much part of Rome, um, you know, city of pine trees. And we know from the marble plan, how much of a part planting is in some of these complexes and all the stands of umbrella pines on the hilltops, that if you don't put trees and you're just missing such a chunk of what the visual impression of the city was, that for me, I've got to have trees. I don't have to have people, but maybe one day I'll put people in on a layer that you can turn on and off. Um, and colour, what would be really nice, along with this kind of four-dimensional model where you can do a slider for, for epoch, would be a slider for detail and for colour. And you can, I mean, I quite the, the little slide I showed that at least turned all the colour off. I find that's, that's crude, but it's quite useful because it forces you to think a bit about colour and material. Maybe a kind of a, a more nuanced version of that where you could dial up and down the architectural coloring would be nice. Okay, I, I see that. Sorry. No, no, it's just it's all more work to do is, um, you know, there's only one of me, but um, and as Gabby was saying, maybe there could be more than one of us and we could all contribute. 
um, someone just had that. I was going to, to wrap it up, but there is one last question, if that's okay with you, uh, Matthew. Yeah, please. So Martin uh, asks you if you, some more work, will you also update your work on the Imperial Four Hour of Rome? Uh, definitely, because we know a lot more about them than we did. I know Martin has a, a lot of stuff online that, that documents and collates a lot of this information. Um, so, for example, the, the 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 Metro C dig behind the former Trajan has uncovered a whole lot of new stuff that is now in the model. Um, and there's still more to do. You know, there's uh, um, Tucci's book on the Temple and Parkis that I need to read properly and take into account. All the new stuff that's been found in Meneghini's digs and elsewhere. So, yes, is the answer. Um, some of those models were made a while ago and they need to be refreshed. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this was um, hugely interesting. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, I hope that really makes it up a little bit for having lost our summer school, our 3D summer school this year. And I would like to finish with another comment from Martin that I think is apt. It says, great work, mm -hmm. everyone. Ottimo lavoro a tutti. Grazie. Uh, so, <laughs> especially to Matthew, of course. So thank you everyone for um, attending this. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for this great lecture. And we're gonna have uh, another one in two weeks. So uh, stay, stay tuned. Um, so yes, thank you and see you in two weeks. Thank you for having me. Bye.